The scripture lessons this morning are from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 1 to 8. Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. It is the kind of fast I have chosen only a day for people to humble themselves. It's only one for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes. Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord. It is not this kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, and set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And then from Romans chapter 14, the first 18 verses. It's called the weak and the strong. Except the ones whose faith is weak without quarrelling over disputable matters, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us live for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, 
As surely, surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment of one another. Instead, make up your mind to put, not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, for them, that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not let your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what is therefore do not let you know is good to be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In this is the word of the Lord. Well, they're very appropriate words for the message we have this morning from the 14th chapter of the letter to the Romans by Paul. And so we're getting right to the very end. In fact, I think I'll be wrapping up Romans next, um, not next week, the week after. Rob Williams will be preaching next week. I will be here, but Rob Williams will be preaching next week. So it'd be great if you can um, come to that. Um, but I should be wrapping up Romans the very next time. So a fortnight from now at last. But anyway, um, as we saw last week, what Paul is doing in this latter section of the letter to the Romans is he's making application of all of the things that are true and how that affects our everyday life. And uh, it's all about love in the end. And as we saw last week, the best way to love God is to love your neighbour, to love your people around you. In doing that, you're actually loving God. And then he gives a little bit more texture to that um, by explaining that uh, there are certain things that you could get all uptight about and put pressure on other people and even though you might be right you end up being wrong by forcing your will upon another person um, some things are just not worth going through because the damage that can be done is so much worse than what would have otherwise uh, taken place i remember one night i had some friends come over when i say friends these, these were our best friends kathy and i had another couple that we knew really well and they came over for a dinner party and after that we played monopoly and uh, it was a quick game. I got lucky and then I got ruthless and I wiped everyone off the board. I won. I don't mind telling you that. I don't always win, but this time I did. And, um, and I've got to tell you, I almost lost my friendship. <laughs> I was so arrogant and so ruthless in the game, bankrupting all my friends. They thought, what's this guy like in real life? You know, and at the end of it, I've got to say, yeah, sure, I won the game, but it wasn't worth it. I wish I'd lost. Uh, I did damage to the relationship and it took some time to recover that over a game, for goodness sakes. And uh, Paul wants to say or argue something similar in his letter to the Romans, um, saying that love is more important than winning an argument over disputable matters. So he talks about this uh, disputable matters, which is an interesting an interesting thing. Disputable matters, and he gives some examples here of um, eating meat or being a vegetarian. Or another example is treating one day as special and holy or treating all days the same. Now, of course, uh, in the church that was in Rome, it was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And, of course, the Jews had a whole bunch of particular ways of seeing the world. They had special days that were marked on their calendar and they considered them more important than other days. Whereas the Gentile believers didn't see it that way and they had a different view of the world. And then it, there also some of the believers in the church thought that if you ate meat, you were taking on the possibility of eating meat that had been sacrificed to an idol or sacrificed to some other God. And therefore, in order to not, you know, 
make yourself unclean by eating those sorts of meat. The best thing to do is only be a vegetarian. It wasn't for health reasons, but for spiritual reasons. And these Paul considers as disputable matters. And um, the word disputable there, by the way, actually comes from the Greek word, which is dialogos, which means two words in conflict. Has anyone ever heard of dialectic? A dialectic is where you have two ideas that oppose each other, and as they bang together, out comes a new idea, emerges from it, which is like a synthesis of those two. And then there's another dialectic taking place over here, which out of which comes another idea, and then those two ideas come together, and they bang together, and there comes another idea. So this idea of dialogos, from which we get the word dialogue, obviously, is to do with two opposing ideas that are banging against each other. And uh, he's saying there's some ideas which aren't that important. Like winning Monopoly is not that important. It's a whole lot more important to keep your friendship. Um, and so he's saying when it comes to disputable matters, matters that are of small importance, don't go to war against your brother or sister to win an argument if it means you're going to cause damage to the relationship. That being said, however, this very passage here has been used to say that uh, everything's up for grabs. That's, not, that's not, the, the, not the case. There are some matters that are actually not disputable. There's some things the church has stood and died on the hill for. Those are the things such as uh, in ethics, sexual morality, marriage, false witness, murder, those sort of things, obviously. And in matters of truth, the resurrection, the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that's not up for dispute. Some people dispute that. Uh, anyone who disputes that is going to find themselves in a place where this isn't just, you know, one of those things, take it or leave it. No, that's undisputable. That's something the church has fought for. The divinity and the humanity of Christ being in one person of Jesus Christ, that's another thing that we just will not give up. Um, all of the creedal statements, say, is the Nicene Creed, the Apostolic Creed, those sort of things. They're worth dying on the hill for. But all the other stuff, not so much. And, uh, and we are, yes, we are a broad church when it comes to matters of, say, style and culture, the expression that we do in worship, baptism, communion, the ways of governing the church. They're all disputable matters, but we ought not to conflate them with the undisputable matters. But anyway, let's get back to the disputable matters. The disputable matters which Paul was writing about here... Um, and we've just mentioned before, had to do with eating and with special days. So Paul says, one person's faith allows them to eat anything. My faith is like that. I can eat squid very happily, even though I've got Jewish blood. But if you're a Jew, you can't. You can't eat squid. And that's the reason for converting to Christianity right there. <laughs> um, you know, and don't get me started on, you know, bacon. And you know, one of the great features of the Christian faith is when you compare it to Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism, we're the only faith where you can eat bacon. So just saying. Um, however, there are some people in the church who would say, I'm never going to eat bacon because it's, it's not kosher, and if, uh, even though they're not Jewish. And Paul is saying, don't go to war over that. It's not worth it. Um, anyway. Let me get back to the Romans. He says here, One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. Um, I'm, I send that verse to my vegetarian friends. <laughs> um, the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them both. In other words, you can... You could go to war on both of those. You could say, look, if you're eating meat, you're taking the risk that you're going to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol, and you shouldn't do that. And so I'm a, I'm a better person for not eating meat. Um, now, that, that's not actually a thing in the church today, although there are vegetarians who won't eat meat for other reasons. And I've actually heard it said, uh, how do you know there's a vegetarian in the room? And the answer is, you don't have to worry about that, they'll tell you. <laughs> Um, anyway, the, but the other person who's strong in faith says, I don't care about the 
about the superstitions of some pagan acolyte who may have sacrificed the meat. I, if I don't, I'm not going to even raise that question. Meat is meat. God loves, God made animals out of meat. Therefore, I'm going to eat meat. Boom. Um, and then he looks down his nose, or she looks down her nose at the other believer who won't eat meat and says, oh, they're, they're weak in faith. But the person who's not eating meat looks down their nose at the other person and then the whole thing falls over. And that's what Paul is really arguing against. He's saying, don't do that. It's not, there's, that's a disputable matter. It's not hard and fast. It's not black and white. It's not worth going to war over. And then, uh, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand for the Lord, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so for the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so for the Lord, and they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. In other words, one person who won't eat meat is doing it to honour God, and the other person who does is doing it for the same reason. So let's not go to war over that. So... Um, um, the strong in faith may be aware that no one day is more special or holy than another and that there's no food that's more sanctified than another and even though they're strong in faith and therefore they're sort of technically correct if they force their superior knowledge on another who feels that they are doing well to consider one day more holy than another and to refrain from meat unless it was sullied by pagan rites, then they may be right, but they end up being dead wrong instead. And it's been well said that you're never so wrong as when you're absolutely sure that you're right. And modern day equivalents would include, say, drinking or not drinking alcohol. I dare say if we took a poll of people in, this, in the church this morning, there'd be some people who'd say, as a believer, you should not drink alcohol. And there'd be others who would say, Jesus made wine. So let's roll out the barrel. So who's right? Well, I can't say. It depends where you stand on that. And you know, if you're if you're an alcoholic, of course, then you should not touch it. And you know, I myself was brought up in a strictly Wesleyan upbringing. My father was from a strict Wesleyan Methodist church. In fact, he even had primitive primitive Methodist roots. And if you know anything about them, they were particularly conservative when it came to the demon drink. And of course it came out of a context. The context of the Methodist church was at the time when gin was flowing in the streets and alcoholism was epidemic in England. And it was destroying lives. And so the church took a stand on that in a way that that separated them from all of that. And so Wesleyans and Methodists were absolutely against drinking alcohol. Um, you know, my own father was actually a member of the Temperance Union. There's still the Temperance Union still going down on, was it Henley Beach Road, I think it is? Yeah. Um, and, but I've got to say, look, this is a disputable, a disputable matter. There are other indisputable matters in the contemporary church today, such as full immersion, adult baptism versus infant baptism. You know, the church has never settled that. It's a disputable matter. It's not worth dying on the hill for. There are various views of the end times. There's, you know, post-millennial, pre-millennial, amillennial, pan-millennial. It'll all pan out all right in the long run, and so on. And they're disputable matters. Um, you know, I've got very strong views on that. I think I'm right. That's why I hold those views. And anyone who agrees with me is also right. However, if I go to war on that, when the church has never settled that, then, that's, um, then I've actually done what is wrong while I'm being right. Anyway, getting back to, um, to the, the matter of alcohol in the church, I can remember actually uh, being brought up in the Tea Tree Gully United, or not United, Methodist Church as it was then, and no one in that church drank alcohol. And if they did, they kept it really well secret. But what did happen at the end of every service, I remember all the men were dressed in black suits, every one of them. And they, were, they had thin black ties, white shirts, black suits. 
they went out and leaned against the fence and lit up a cigarette <laughs> and leaned on the fence and talked about theology while smoking. And that was considered perfectly okay. Now, there's almost the exact opposite now. In churches, generally speaking, it's kind of frowned upon to smoke. But now those same men, if they were alive today, and many of them are, of course, <laughs> But if they were a part of the church today, there's every chance that they wouldn't be smoking, but they'd go down the pub for lunch after church. So it all, you know, it's all just, it's neither here nor there. So it's certainly not worth getting all thingy about. That being said, if you are thingy about something, and it's really important to you, and I think that I've got a superior knowledge and I trample on your idea, then I've actually completely failed the whole thing um, myself. So, you'll notice, however, that Paul does say that one person has weak faith and another has strong faith. But both the person who has strong faith and weak faith do what they do because they're constrained by conscience. Now, the word conscience is never actually used in the Bible, interestingly. It talks more about consciousness. But the, the same idea is still embedded there uh, of... Um, People are doing what they do because they believe that's the best way to serve God, by not drinking alcohol or by being free to drink it or by barracking for Port Adelaide or Adelaide. They're disputable matters. Whatever. Then it's not worth getting thingy about. But um, you should live by your conscience. Nothing wrong with that. But conscience is not the, is not the voice of God. My conscience is not the voice of God. My conscience is like a computer. It can be programmed. Good data in, good data out. Bad data in, bad data out. My conscience can be programmed by the word of God and by wisdom. And there are things that I would, I would have considered, felt guilty about when I was a young man, which I have no guilt at all about now because my conscience has been reprogrammed by the word of God. And alcohol is one of those. I don't mean to offend anyone if you... But I do drink alcohol. There it is. I've said it. And I was brought up by, you know, I'm sure my father was not happy about that, <laughs> being in the temperance union and so, so on. But something changed. I was living in Darwin and uh, had never touched alcohol. And has anyone lived in Darwin? Yeah. People drink there. Have you noticed that? I, I, had a, I actually had an, uh, a workmate who would be well described as a raging alcoholic. And he said, I only drink to excess on days when it gets over 30 degrees. <laughs> so it was about two days, two days of the year he managed to skip that. Anyway, but I was, I was actually, I found myself offending my friends by not drinking. And I had the strangest experience where I felt as if the best thing I could do was actually to have a beer at a social gathering. And, and it was a, a change, you know, it, my conscience said no, but I sensed my conscience being reprogrammed. And that's what Paul is talking about. If your conscience says no, you shouldn't do it. If it says yes, then fine. But make sure your conscience is being programmed by the truth. That's all he's saying. And you've got to be open to letting your conscience be reprogrammed along the way. You know, and, and I, again, I put out the caveat. That does not mean you, you know, it's a free-for-all just because you might feel like you can do whatever you like. I've met plenty of people in, church, in churches over the years who, who take this very passage and use it to be a free-for-all to do what you like. It's certainly not advocating for that. And that's where your conscience can be wrong. Always be aware your conscience is not God. It can be wrong. Um, the most important thing is not to get your way as it is to love one another. As it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 7 where Paul deals with a very similar matter. He says the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you're completely defeated already. He was saying the Christians in the Corinthian church were taking each other to court over all kinds of things and suing one another, 
And he said, if you, as believers, can't get this settled outside of a court, then you've completely lost the plot. And he says, why not, you who are strong, why not rather just be wronged? Why not just get cheated? You know, I, I've, I've met people who, who got ripped off by someone in the past from the church or even a church leader or something like that. And they hang on to it until the day they die and they're bitter to the grave. And I think, that's not worth it. Here's an option. Here's an option that Paul suggests. Someone wrongs you. What do you do about it? Take them to court and get every set. No, he says, sometimes you just take the choice to just be wronged. That's it. That's hard. I mean, it's hard to swallow, isn't it? But that, he's saying that's the greater, that's the greater path because love is more important than getting your own way. And then he, he wraps up this whole section here by saying, the kingdom of God is not about what you eat or drink. He says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister, for I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. So he's saying there's no such thing as unclean food. There's no special days. You know, Easter day is not more special than Easter Monday, as far as Paul is concerned. But he's saying, so he's convinced that that's the truth. But if anyone regards something as unclean, or as, you know, as one day being really special, then for that person, it is unclean. So if your brother or sister is distressed by what you eat, you should no longer, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not, do not let what you know be spoken of as, as evil. For the kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking. It's about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So that's what really matters is doing what is right sometimes means being wronged. And keeping peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's way more important. Let me um, just finish with this. You know, when, when Jesus was having a go at the Pharisees in Matthew 23, he announced a number of woes upon them. But one of the woes, he said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy and faithfulness. You, sh you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind, you blind guides, you strain out the gnat, but you swallow the camel. So what he's saying there is, yes, you should tithe everything. That's good. He's not saying that's wrong, but he's saying you keep the minute of the law and yet you ignore the big things. The big things being, for instance, honouring your father and mother. But you'll dishonour your father and mother in order to keep the minute of the law or other things. So... Um, so he's saying, yes, do everything right. And even if you do do everything right, you can be totally wrong if you um, offend your brother or sister. So in the end, it comes down again. For the, I think this is the third time we've mentioned this now, that the, the law is summed up in this one thing, love. Amen.